Hi, this is Eric Dureck, and welcome to this edition of Med Health Fit, the TV show that integrates wellness and healthcare. And tonight, I am very happy to have from Santa Barbara Thermography, uh, Miss Mary Tango. Welcome to the show, Mary. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Well, it's it's great to have you because, as I mentioned before the show, I've been a fan of thermography as an assessment tool uh, since I started when I started working with cancer patients back in. The early 1990s, and and I always felt that thermography, uh, a was is probably non-invasive, but b also sort of did more. Um, so my, my first question to you is, give us a little bit of information on the difference between uh, mammography, which is what most women are recommended to get, and thermography, what you practice. Okay, <clears throat> okay, so it's actually a really different screening tool, and. When people call and ask me if it's a substitute for mammography, I always have to explain it's almost like comparing apples to oranges or a stethoscope to a microscope because you're getting completely different information. And mammography or ultrasounds are seeing densities and we are looking at activity. We're looking at physiology. So, and I have a quick example that I always use with people. And is if I were to take a penny and put it in my breast and sew myself up, I might get an infection or an allergic reaction or some kind of inflammation. If I were to run off and get a mammogram, it would only see the penny. If I were to get a thermogram, it would not see the penny, but it would see the reaction to the penny. So, and that would be something that would be missed on the mammogram. So they're totally different screening tools. And on a, and on a thermogram, that activity from the penny may, may show up as uh, different colors, red, yellow, orange, green or so, as opposed to the blueness or uh, whatever, the, whatever the normalcy color may be of the breast tissue as a whole. And, and we actually have a picture right here on the screen that is, is showing uh, well, it's going to be the right breast versus the left one, and the, the left breast seems to have the green and blue and yellow seem to be normal activity, right? Right, and actually that's one of the main tools of thermography is that we're looking for asymmetry. So we're always comparing right to left, even if, even if we're doing other parts of the body. And so on the right tissue, what are we seeing with like flames and bright colors? Yeah, and I believe that that picture is inflammatory breast cancer. Mm -hmm. um, most of the, the photos that I sent you, are all, they're all clinically proven. And inflammatory breast cancer is something that is actually very hard to detect. And thermography can, can actually pick that up. So we're seeing inflammation on that one well, on that one side. Can we that, pull it up one more time, Michael? It really probably isn't a normal um, thermal pattern. Okay, well, okay, so there it is again. So underneath, we're just looking at the normal heat from, from the breast overlaying the skin. Right, that's but on normal. that on that right breast, we actually see, uh, you know, on the top part, a very, very deep red and actually whiteness around the, the, the areolus there. Uh, so, I mean, so clearly something is going on. Exactly. It's just telling us that something is going on. And if um, a doctor would read that and he would look at your clinical information, because I always have people fill out a form about their history and all that, he would probably say this warrants clinical correlation. This needs to go somewhere else. I mean, you don't diagnose because you're not a doctor, which I always say is a very good thing. But you have a pretty keen eye on this after doing it for so many years, correct? I do, I do, and I've done so many of them that sometimes I can tell when something, because what we're doing is we're monitoring for changes over time. So the best benefit of thermography is to really get, uh, if we're just talking about breasts, is to get thermal, you have to establish a baseline. Mm -hmm. So you do one now and then you do another one in three months because everyone has their own, uh, it's like a thumbprint, your right, own thermal right, patterns. Right, right. And we want to know that those two are not changing and then it's once a year after that. Okay, so, so I was gonna say you probably recommend on a regular basis just to look at things over years. Yeah, because okay. the mm -hmm. doctor will keep, like I have people that have been doing it for 15 years, so they're always gonna look at their prior scans and compare and see if anything's changing. Excellent, um, so when we drill down to mammography, um, I find a couple things from my study of public health and epidemiology and you know relative risk and all this stuff. First, that the, each each type of assessment in medicine has a sensitivity 
and a specificity. It's sensitive means that you know you can pick up the the the, the inflammation around that penny because it's sensitive to that. And the specificity is that you're really looking for inflammation, not, not something else. And, and you put those two things together and it's called the positive predictive value of a test. If you're mm -hmm. testing blood sugar, you're testing the blood sugar, not the cholesterol. And if it reads 95 milligrams per deciliter, that's essentially what it is. The positive predictive value of a mammogram in most cases is 0.55, which means it's wrong half of the time it actually can have a false positive or a false negative reading almost half of the time mm -hmm. in, in, in most women. And to me that doesn't, I, I don't have a lot of, uh, you know, I, the test is not that great, but still everyone wants to use it or everyone's told to use it. Right. Well, I mean, this is the problem. There is no screening tool that's 100%. So that, but that's a positive a big predictive problem. value of 0.88 for any test is the gold standard. So if it's 0.91 or 0.96 or even 0.89, it's a pretty good test. Like your cholesterol check, if it's 141 and it's 141, then it's okay. If it's you know if if it's really 190 but it's measuring at 246, there's a problem with with the test. Like the lady you know up in the Silicon Valley who had the um, she had the uh, the uh, assessment the blood lab company. And I can't remember her name now, but she said she was going to do everything with a finger stick. Well, it turned out she was lying about everything. The positive predictive value of her test was zero because mm -hmm. they, they didn't. They, she lied about everything. So I want you know. I know that therm, that, that thermography is a, is a has a very high positive predictive value. We already know that because what you just said. It's looking for the activity, as opposed to just this sort of two dimensional screening. But this is true, but there's one thing that I have to tell you. If there were one or two cells that were sitting in a calcification and they were doing nothing and they were not growing and there wasn't any activity around it, was, you know, cancer cells can often recruit a blood supply, which yes. is angiogenesis. Yes, gems, and if right. that mm -hmm. wasn't happening, the thermography would not pick it up. Because it would not be, and I'm going to use the word hot spot, is that if it's got blood supply and if it's got some sort of things going through there, probably it's going to, it may resonate a little bit differently. Right, it would look differently. And even, um, you know, there are thermal thermography scans that, like with ductal carcinoma in situ, that will have a, actually a cold center. There'll be a vascular pattern around it, and then there'll be a cold center. And that is one way that they're sometimes able to detect it. But Because it's a higher shade of blue or green. See right in here, so we've got a couple... Uh, deep blue tissues on the right, and Michael will keep this slide up for a second, versus I'm going to say the one on the left is normal. I mean, I, I don't Actually, know. Actually, they're both normal. Okay. Because a lot of women have fibrocystic breasts. And, and the fibrocystic is the deep blue pockets right there on the right? Actually, person? no. The fibrocystic are, is the red on the right. The red the, on the, the, the red on the right okay, are, got it, got are the it. fibrocystic patterns, probably, in those pictures, because and, but the thing about fibrocystic is they don't usually grow. Um, the temperature might increase depending on what's going on with that person or the time of year or something, but okay. they don't usually change in size. So if we start monitoring somebody's thermal patterns and they have a lot of fibrocystic breast tissue, usually it doesn't change in size. Okay. So that's one way that we can monitor for, sh for changes. The one on the left-hand side where there's the orange spot in the middle, that's not actually even breast tissue, that's the, that's the sternum. Yes, that's okay. a sternum, yeah. So there may be something else going on there and you as a professional would look at that and say, oh, that, well that's a little bit different than, than the cysts on the actual breast tissue. There's one, two, three, four on the left breast and a couple smaller ones on the right. So. Yeah, and that's very possible, and it could be that sometimes we can see when people have just had a cold or if they have some sort of inflammation for some other reason. Mm -hmm. um, but as, you have to remember that we're not really seeing cysts, but we're seeing the activity around. Right. around okay, it, right, right, right. Because the it. body is always, if it's a cyst, it's a kind of a foreign type object that the body is seeing, and it's trying to do something whether it's, like you say, inflammatory response or something of that nature, even heat, just to sort of get, uh, yeah, get and, into its homeostasis, <clears throat> I would imagine. Right. And, um, you know, ultrasounds also see cysts. Ultrasounds are a really good screening tool to see cysts. Okay. Um, <clears throat> the biggest complication around all of this is the, the calcifications. So if you see a calcification on an ultrasound, what radiologists say is they're probably benign. But um, the mammograms are the one things that pick up calcifications. 
80% of calcifications are benign, 20% of those may be suspicious, and within that there might be a 2-5% to that should be removed. So you have to weigh out your exposure, your genetics. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a really hard topic to, to say that because there, there isn't any one screening tool that we can rely on 100%. Right, but there's a difference between a fibrocystic, or fibrocystic lump and a, a, a growing cancer. Right, and usually they have different shapes and, okay. and sizes and, you know, it's hard to draw an absolute on all of that, too, though. Right, but I'm trying to make the case here. I'm working for you. Here, I know you're trying. That to. <laughs> that 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 a thermogram, on the whole, works better than a mammogram. I, I, and again, it's my opinion based on you know the limited amount of research that I've done. But I've never been that impressed with with the like I say the positive predictive value of that test. Now, in the last few years, they may have gotten better. Well, but you can't get much worse than 0.55, Mary. I'm just telling you that. No, right no, now. no. I, you know, it's just I, I am. I just don't want to bash mammograms. I don't actually think that. I think that they may be making people get too many mammograms. Well, and, and, and that's 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 a financial decision. But but you use thermography. I use thermography, and we can pick up changes a lot sooner than a mammogram can pick up changes in well, some instances. I would mention there's probably a reason that you're using thermography is that you have a philosophy about this this assessment tool, right. which. And again, one of the things here that I talk about in my next question is that it, is it a non-invasive tool? It's completely non-invasive. You can do it every day. You can do it every day. There's nothing being projected at you. There is only, we are only just reading the infrared. You're picking up stuff that's coming at you as opposed to ionizing radiation that's going into you. And these, this is one of the other problems that I have with a lot, like x-rays. We talked about, you know, my daughter and, and you know, and, 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 and dental x-rays. I had a full facial x-ray in, in high school. I will never do that again. I absolutely mm -hmm. will never, probably in my, the rest of my life, get a dental x-ray. And people say, well, what is going to, I said, if, if the dentist is worth or her, his or her salt, they'll be able to pick up. And I had a dentist that, that took cam uh, had a nice uh, camera. And he would go in there and say, oh, you see that? That might be, that might be a, uh, you know, it's like, oh, well, so you have other ways that you can do this that are non-invasive. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I think one of the issues about medicine is that, you know, is that, is that pharmaceuticals are invasive. They're, 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 they're poison. And mammograms, are, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. These things over time may actually have issues. So, right. I mean, we know yeah. that if somebody yeah. has a BRCA gene, that they don't metabolize radiation very well. And so here you are, you're shooting, you know, ionizing radiation on cells that have very sensitive DNA. Right. And we know that ionizing radiation, which is completely, everyone knows this, does, does damage DNA. Right. So that is something to really take into consideration depending mm -hmm. on each person's mm -hmm. genetic history. Mm -hmm. So the last slide, Michael, that we have is a slide of a person's back. And we want to take a look at, because we talk about breast tissue, which has its own morphology. It has its own sort of uh, the way that it expresses itself uh, on the uh, thing. Now we have here a person with uh, checking out a person's gluteus maximus here. Right. Um, this is a swimmer who has pain in the left glute area. So what are you looking at there when, when you're taking... So I believe that that one is uh, myofascial trigger points. So people okay. can have um, areas where the, you know, the muscle is where the highest point of stress and you can have a little knot there, which can be very painful. Mm -hmm. And that, I believe, are, are trigger points and, in that area. And, and in the picture, Michael's going to put up a couple times. So you're looking at the, the Y, which is like this, this, this I'm going to call it a hot spot. Right. And then the white area is in there. And it, it could be anything from, like you say, a trigger point to a slight tear in a muscle or something with the fascia above the muscle, and, and you can actually see that, you know, at least you're not diagnosing, but you're making a good assessment, say, well, right. on this point right here, this is what we're seeing Yeah, we're seeing so. that something's going on, you have a lot of inflammation in that area, and mm -hmm. so that, it's a, it really is a screening tool to give us some information that something might be going on. Right, and again, non-invasively. Now, I, I know that maybe a chiropractor uh, or a massage therapist could do a manual type thing, and they might, they might possibly get the same type of assessment where they're pressing and they're having them move in mm -hmm. a certain area or whatever. But for what you do, you can actually use it for a lot of different tools in, a, in addition to using just solely for 
breast, for breast health. For breast health. Well, yeah, as an acupuncturist, actually, we have a whole other series of tools of information for the meridians. So you can actually look at those scans mm -hmm. and maybe get a little more of an idea of where there's not mm -hmm. enough chi flow or where energy isn't moving. Mm -hmm. um, but there are a lot of under, other indications for thermography, like thyroid, for example. If somebody has a low thyroid, it's going to show up on thermography. It will, it will be a cold color. Okay. Um, ex dental cavitations. If, a lot of people don't know if they have infections in their teeth, and you can see that with a thermography scan. You can see heat. Heat. You know? and it's interesting that you say that because I, I know that from some of my health websites that I peruse over, you know, over the course of a week, uh, I know that I've seen time and time again where people will post on health sites that in, in 90 some percent of cases with people with cancers, oral cancers, head and neck cancers, et cetera, they've had root canals. So you're getting mm -hmm. this hugely invasive thing and the body mm -hmm. is reacting to it in such, such a, 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 you know, a massive way that you know, it, it may be creating something. And again, this is, this is what I look at when I, when I see medicine is that you know, for 100 years, dentists have been using dental amalgams and now we've got vaccine companies using aluminum and all you know, these things that are toxic ingredients. And, and you know, thermography, thermography would be probably a very, very interesting way of picking up a lot of different types of inflammatory responses. Can you do anything with gut? Uh, uh, intestinal um, you know, in inflammation? Well, people will call me and they'll ask if it's a substitute for a colonoscopy and I have to explain the same, you know, with the, the, the penny. Right, right, um, right. Because it's not looking inside the colon, so it's right. completely different. But if somebody has um, a lot of inflammation, for example, I had a woman who had um, her, her appendix removed a long time ago and she was always in a lot of pain there and I scanned her and it was black there was a black circle. And what that means is there's no circulation. It's ice cold. So I had said, you know, you gotta start massaging that area. There's, there's no chi going through that area. That's probably why you have a lot of pain. You might have scar tissue there. Um, I had had a woman who fell off of a horse who had um, pins in her ankles and for years it hurt. And so we scanned it and found out that there was the same thing, it was black, there was mm -hmm. no circulation. So instead of it being really inflamed, it was more that she wasn't getting any blood flow down to the right. area. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of, there are a lot of different indications that you can get. I just came from a conference um, where we did um, for skin cancer, which was really, inf really interesting. Uh -huh. We cold stressed an area that we thought might have had, had some sort of a lesion. And then um, you, you scan, every minute and if there is a lesion there it will heat up much faster than the rest of the area and that was really um, an interesting hmm. revelation I haven't really started doing that in my practice but it's another well, way. Well you have a lot of options now one of the things that you brought here is is something that you also use in addition to and this is I would I would say as much a learning tool for your for your female patients as anything. Right, um, when women come in, for, this is basically new, I actually just, just ordered this um, because I was aware of it from the conference, but it's a way for women to palpate their breasts and feel what isn't normal and what is normal, and it comes with a, um, a whole um, count, um, a manual okay. and tells you how to palpate exactly so you can feel we'll so you can actually here. feel, for yeah, Michael, sorry. if you want to take it to, I guess we'll go to camera three here. So it has a large lump, uh, a medium-sized lump at the top, a very small lump at the top, and then one way down in, in deep in the tissue. Right. So this would give women the opportunity to know how to palpate, which exactly. is the anatomical name for, for feeling tissue, uh, in different areas with different, and this is a little harder than, the, you know, et cetera. So yes. I think these are really interesting. I told you 20 years ago, there was a company that made one like a, like uh -huh. a crepe yeah. that you put over the, the, uh, uh, the woman's, her own breast and then she, she could palpate and they had a little diagram. But this is interesting because it's got different size things on it. And this is called My Breast Friend. Um, right, so My Best Friend. I don't know if you want to hold it up. Right up, up in there, Michael, we'll go to. You can find it online. Go. Yeah, it's mybreastfriend.com here. And so I think that any of these types of tools that women can use that are non-invasive that will teach them about this because I also know, you know, when I did my tenure working with patients that there's, there's an awful lot of ignorance. They just don't understand some of these things. Right. So they, you know, they rely on the doctors and the doctor, well, we're just going to get the mammogram because, you know, there's a financial incentive there. Whereas this 
is a tool that you know a, a woman could could purchase and she could talk about it with friends and and you know it's an educational thing and you have that with your practice and and I, I, I think that you know all of these things are important and I also wanted to, to say this before I, I forget it that it's it's very intriguing to me that you are an acupuncturist and you've already mentioned twice tonight about meridians and chi which most people who do mammograms have no, no idea yeah 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 that's true well and you know, 70% of women that are perimenopausal find their own breast lumps. Mm -hmm. And 50% of them that are um, in menopause, if I have that statistic not reversed, find their own breast lumps. So that's why uh, Yeah, really I, I know too that the majority of women in the shower or whatever, and if they have a tool like my breast friend, it's going to make it a little bit easier. How much does a scan usually cost? Is it, is, is it uh, covered by insurance? And, you know, how many scans would a woman after 40 usually have? You said about once a year after they get their initial. Right. And unfortunately, it isn't covered by insurance yet. If you have a health savings account, you can put it on that. Okay. Um, you can always be your own advocate. And, you know, if you can get your doctor to refer it, you might be able to fight for it. But right mm -hmm. now, they're not covering it. Um, a breast scan is 195 And then three months... You have to do your baseline, and I give $25 off on that, so okay. people will do it, and that's $170. And then upper body is $250, and that includes the breast. That goes from the pubic bone up, and okay. it includes the breast. So you get more information. Carotid artery heat is another thing um, that is very important to find out if you have inflammation in your carotid arteries. That's interesting. Um, so that's $250. And then a full body is $350, and that is including the legs. Okay. So, and would you look at, uh, if you're looking at carotid vasculature, are you, are you looking for peripheral vascular uh, in the lower legs as well too? Like with women, if there's a breast cancer issue that they've had before, they've got lymphedema or someone with PVD or something of that nature, that, that w this is, would be used for that as well. Yeah, sometimes you can pick up um, lymphatic congestion, uh, which I don't interpret. The doctor who reads the report uh, or reads the scan, the imaging would say that. And deep vein thrombosis sometimes. Right, that's, that's, okay, yes. Um, there's also something called reflex syndrome dystrophy, which can happen um, when people have chronic pain syndromes. So a, a, a peripheral nervous system, which is actually showing up, which you might not be able to visually or see. Or not showing up, actually. Not showing, okay. Yeah, so that's, that's another thing. So <sighs> thermography is not part of mainstream medicine, or is it? It's becoming, okay. you know, I mean, if you were to get online, there's a lot of doctors now that are, you know, speaking about it, that are recommending it, okay. much more than when I first started doing thermography, which was about 15 years ago. You've been in a while. And there, there's a, a, other centers in town, we won't mention them because they're not on the show. It's, you, we're, you know, this is your time. And we'll, we'll get all of your information at the end of the show. Um, but do you get a lot of referrals from women's uh, oncologist or women's health physicians, um, anti-aging doctors, etc. Um, I would say I don't get a lot of referrals, but I do get some, and it's becoming more and more. Um, and it, you know, it is a screening tool that because women are asking for it. It's also a reason why doctors are are allowing it because some of them are some some women are refusing to get mammograms. And that has nothing to do with me. I have so many people that come in and say, I refuse to do one more mammogram. Yeah. Well, they have to do something. So I always recommend do thermography, do ultrasounds. Um, an MRI might be something that might, you know, depending on each individual person. Right, right. Um, so it is becoming much more um, sought after because of the reason of people not wanting to do mammograms. Right, well, I mean, I'm gonna, obviously, you know, when I go home tonight, my wife is gonna say, well, who did you have on the show, dear? And I'm gonna right. say, well, I had this lady, Mary Tango, and, you know, I think you should really look into what she's doing because I don't think that she, she I, I'm just, I'm not a fan of, of mammography. I just, it, there's something about it. I've read the literature, but there's also something about it that, that, that as a guy who will never have one, I don't have any skin in the game. Um, so I'm trying to just go about this from the standpoint of this is, this is why I, it just doesn't sit right with me. And there's a lot of medical procedures that don't sit right with me, like x-rays versus MRI. You know, 20 some odd years ago when I had a knee injury, I had x-rays. Well, 
eight, nine years ago when I had another knee injury, I had an MRI. Oh my God, the amount of information from the MRI versus the x-ray from years, 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 mm -hmm. years ago, it was night and day. It mm -hmm. was unbelievable what I was actually able to see within the knee uh, with, the, the, with the meniscus tissue, but also with bone and some of the other things too, because you know, at my age, I'm, you know, hey, how does the knee look in terms of arthritis? Oh my God, it's amazing. I, you know, <laughs> I dodged a bullet on that, but I could see it through the MRI, which I've just, I've always felt that MRI is just amazing technology versus CT scanning, which uses ionizing, you know, uses radiation. Mm -hmm. So I always try to steer people that when a doctor says, well, we have to do a CT, no, you don't have to do a CT because MRI is as good, depending on what you're looking for. And again, you, like with your, your treatment, your, I'm sorry, your assessment, you're looking at this invasiveness versus non-invasiveness plus the information that you get. And there's a trade-off of these things. There's always a trade-off in medicine, sure. and, I, and some people don't get that because their doctors know that there's, you know, there's always this money issue. Um, I just want to say one quick thing. Go ahead. Because I want to go back to the other time. question you asked me. And at the conference that I went to, one of our radiologists who is a, does mammography all day long, and he is one of our um, doctors that do the reads for the, th for the thermography, he made a statement and he said that doctors really don't know anything about thermography. They don't understand it and they don't know anything about it. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the reasons why you don't get a lot of referrals because they don't really, they weren't really trained to understand the benefits of it. Um, it was at, in the 1970s when thermography first came to, I believe, the US, they weren't using proper controls and they weren't using, um, you know, the protocols weren't working and that's when the AMA took a look at it and said, this is, this is not working. But yeah. since then they've gone back and really, studied it and come it's, up it's, with Is baselines. it big in Europe? Is it big in Europe or bigger? really big in Europe. That's what yeah. I thought. I thought because yeah. Germany has got, I was just talking with, about another type of, of treatment. Um, there's a, a place in Santa Barbara that has compression sleeves for lymphedema and stuff. And, and when you look at the medical research, there's a, company, there's a company in Europe that has been doing this research for 40 years. I mean, it's just amazing the amount of stuff. So um, how can people get, with, with less than a minute to go, how can people, you're at 7, 20, 1725 yes, State? Yes, 1725 Are you with State. Anthony Carr? And, Anthony Carr, yeah. Anthony, Anthony Carr. and I are colleagues together. Excellent. Um, well, he's a big name guy in town, so yes. that, that's good company to be in. And um, so, and, and what's your website? Oh, it's my name, MaryTango.com, which is the spell spelling. It. Well, is it's, it's right the there best. on the screen right now. People there get, get a chance to see it. <laughs> this, is, this is an amazing topic. I'm really glad that you, you were on the show, and, and I appreciate all the information that you've given to us about not just my breast friend, but, but really the benefits of thermography. Because like I say, I've, I've been really high on this, this type of assessment for a long time, and now we've had you on the show. We've learned a lot more. So for Mary Tango and the Santa Barbara Thermography, this is Eric Durack for MedHealth Fit and thanks for watching.